Okay, I'm ready. I hope you had a relaxing Labor Day weekend. I went up to Connecticut to Lime Rock Park for the 41, for the first uh, festival, which is a series of races of historic cars. And on Saturday and Monday, and on Sunday, a concorso on the street of the racetrack for the most qualified vintage cars. And anyone with a decent car can come in and park around the rest of the racetrack. They often have more than a thousand cars all together over there. I just downloaded my pictures this morning, but when I have them available, when I have time, I'll post some of those pictures for you. The program for this week is simple. We're going to talk about the history of the technology of the automobile, but also about the history of technologies related to mobility in general. So as you see here, we start with a presentation listed under week two called Before the Automobile. Then we'll go back in time with a second presentation that offers an overview of mobility, technologies related to mobility, and energy sources, because mobility and energy sources, of course, go hand in hand. And finally, on Thursday, I'll be talking about the future of the automobile. What's going to happen? Will the Green Revolution maintain the dominant position of the automobile? Or will it be the end of that technology essentially for societies such as American, North American societies and Western European societies who've all planned the demise of traditional vehicles with internal combustion engines? Okay. On Thursday, as we've done last week, we will watch a few more scenes from Herbie from The Love Bag, 1968, and that'll be the last time we will uh, watch that film. On Friday of this week, the, at the, by the end of the day, the first assignments are due, the first written assignment. There are two options for it. One is about the magic of the automobile. The other is about the same thing, but through not through personal memories and personal reflections. The alternative is based on a very nice made-for-TV movie, which you can find on Amazon Prime. And that is based on <coughs> an article from the New York Times, which you can also read through a link. I've mentioned the assignments, I'll go back to them on Thursday, but more importantly because you have to make sure between now and Friday that you have access to a Google Docs file which I shared with each one of you individually. Make sure you can write on it that I set the editing privileges correctly for you. And if you add it, to the class, let me know that I need to create one more Google Docs. I received an email earlier today, for example, from a new student, and right away, in five minutes, I created a Google Docs file for this new student. Talking about new students, I'll be circulating the attendance, as usual, before the end of the class. However, since I was away through the weekend, I didn't have time to update the attendance. So if your name is not there, simply add it, print your name and then sign at the end of the third page. Please come in. Okay? So without further ado, let's go to through this presentation. I updated this presentation this morning. Um, images that were there did not load correctly and I wanted to make some changes anyway, which I did. It's not a long presentation. It is some 
of the basic info about the technologies and the developments that led to the creation of the automobile. Okay, and it starts with this image where you should be able to recognize at least the old man in this elegant Italian suit. And he is Enzo Ferrari. The uh, image is from the early 1950s. He is in conversation with Alberto Ascari, Italian race driver, winner of two Formula One championships at the beginning of the official history of the Formula One championships with the same kind of setup and rules that we have today. And next to Ferrari, a British writer, uh, uh, racer, uh, Mike Hawthorne, uh, both Hawthorne and Ascari would be dead within a few years from this picture. The first to die would be Ascari. They called him, they told him, there is a new Ferrari 750 at Monza, would you like to try? And of course, he drove there, didn't even put on his uh, uniform. Not that it would have made a difference because we're not talking about fireproof garments at this point, mm. but he simply put his tie, he had a tie, he put it in the shirt so that it wouldn't be flying and went out and did not complete one of the laps. We don't know, there were no eyewitnesses, what happened to him, suspension failure, tire failure, but his car rolled and he was killed. Author would die a little later, and I'm not sure, but maybe he didn't die on the racetrack, maybe he died driving his Jaguar on a British road. Ferrari himself, during this period and the early 1960s often, was depicted in a less than positive way because a lot of people, journalists especially, insisted that he pushed his drivers too hard. And he demanded that his drivers take too many risks and in a way, therefore, was indirectly responsible for a number of deaths. Because throughout the 1950s and 60s, a lot of drivers died on the racetrack. And for example, we know that Enzo Ferrari loved to say that it's not good for a, for a race car driver to get married and start a family before the end of their career, because after they do that, they don't go as fast as they used to. Ferrari himself had been a driver, right? Uh, in, in fact, he had been an average race car driver during the late 1910s and the early 1920s, became much more successful as the manager of the first Scuderia Ferrari, which was essentially an Alfa Romeo team. Uh, essentially the official Alfa Romeo team became the Scuderia Ferrari and he had signed a non-compete agreement and that's why he had to wait then until the end of the 1940s to start his own factory and produce cars under his own and produce and race cars under his own name. Survived the war but came close to being killed by the Italian partisans because his factory during the war, World War II, was forced to produce tools, mechanical tools, not vehicles, but mechanical tools and spare parts for the German army, which seized after 1943 a number of factories in northern Italy. So why Ferrari? Because Ferrari, who was, of course, also an amateur automobile historian, used to say the car, the history of the automobile, begins with a wheel. And we don't know who invented the wheel, but according to Ferrari, according to his poetic imagination, whoever invented the wheel, they must have seen a flower or some kind of seed rolling 
over uh, the grass and gotten the idea of the will from that kind of natural observation. It is a naive statement because the will itself seems something that anyone here could invent, but the key is to be able to couple, combine the will with the axle and have a mechanism that allows the axle to rotate freely while supporting some kind of a platform such as a cart. Here you see a representation from ancient Mesopotamia about 2500 BC, right, with a military cart uh, pulled by, these are not horses, these are a kind of donkey, because donkeys are strong, but also uh, um, less temperamental and less sensitive than horses. So horses, if you take them on the battlefield, you have to make sure they're properly trained because otherwise they'll react emotionally to any kind of big chaos. Whereas donkeys have a long history of being used in the military, with the only issue being that, as I said, they're stubborn. So if they don't want to move, you'll have a jolly good time trying to convince them. If they want to walk right on the edge of a cliff, they'll do so. But up until World War I, you have donkeys carrying artillery pieces, for example, supplies of all kinds. So a will and axle combination is one of the six basic machines. That is to say, a machine in this context is something that would be able to amplify whatever energy you apply, okay? And you are familiar with all the others, the basic lever or lever, however you want to pronounce it, the inclined plane, the wedge, the screw, the pulley, right? And then for wheel and axle, the uh, put there well for whatever reason, but it is similar, right? Because you have the axle here and you're turning it. And you can click on the link, but it's just the links are there just be, for, for your curiosity. And this is from one of Leonardo da Vinci's manuscript because we jump quite a bit in time to get what some people consider to be a first form of a self-propelling vehicle. And you probably know how Leonardo da Vinci was allegedly the inventor of all kinds of things, right? Can you name some things that are commonly assigned to Leonardo da Vinci's mind? Medicine? Didn't he make some sort of flying machine of some kind? Right, or yes, a flying apparatus whereby a man flat on this would be able to move his arms and uh, flap wings. That would be one uh, example. And there is also an anecdote, but we don't know whether it is true that it was tried and, of course, crashed. But there are other flying machines that are also um, assigned to Leonardo's, Leonardo's genius. So we have kind of a plane or a flying man apparatus. What else? Leonardo and technologies, inventions. Oh, yes. Yeah, I was trying to make like a helicopter. A helicopter, right? Not a regular helicopter, awesome. but one with a spiral that would rotate and uh, uh, create uh, possibly <laughs> enough power to, to pull it through the air. What else? Isn't it thought that he might have had plans for the world's first automaton? Automaton, yes. Well, actually, he did a few. He did a flying pigeon, and there is enough anecdotal evidence to, to uh, believe that uh, it is true. So it was basically a toy, and in fact, there used to be a series on TV 
don't remember whether it was maybe it was called the Medici's where they see this the way they show this flying bird they have Leonardo as one of the characters um, and towards the end of his life he was in France where he died as a protege of uh, the king of France and according to Vasari who wrote a biography of Leonardo around the 1550s um, he created a lion because the lion was part of the emblem of the royals of France and the lion would be able to walk towards the king the throne of the king then raise the front paws and the torso the, of, of the rib cage of the lion opened and from there a bouquet of lilies came out because the lily was also a symbol of the monarchy of the French monarch so you can call those automata and of everything we've mentioned so far it is something that is possibly authentic what else that's it no more so traditionally he is considered to be the inventor of scuba diving apparatus of the parachute of the tank the automobile the bicycle the uh, machine gun um, different kinds of machine guns including a rotating uh, machine gun similar to the Gatling uh, used during the Civil War in the US and I'm sure I'm forgetting some other invention but those are the basic inventions now I'm here to tell you that we didn't know much about Leonardo until the 1960s when some of the notebooks a lot of the notebooks we have now were discovered rediscovered in Spain we didn't know much scholars didn't know much until the 19 late 1970s 80s about engineers in Europe during the late Middle Ages and Renaissance the, the peers of Leonardo we now know even though the media continue to ignore that a little detail uh, we now know that a lot of engineers from Leonardo's <coughs> time and even from the 14th century the 15th century traveled through Europe offering their services and they brought with them manuscripts that were essentially their portfolios were these fantastic inventions to show that they should be paid handsomely because they were able to do a parachute to create a parachute or an apparatus to go underwater and other things for with with possible military applications none of those things were actually ever realized they were part of a professional exercise right it was a portfolio and this explains also why you look at something like this and clearly does it look like a blueprint this is not finished it's an unfinished sketch right it's like an engineering half thinking something that might work and this is better than many other so-called inventions so as far as the parachute different kinds of parachutes from Italy to France to Germany a lot of people drew on manuscripts something that would work like a modern parachute same with scuba diving apparatuses the flying machine never flew other than the toys in form of a toy okay the tank was never made and just imagine the animals inside with shooting guns resonating through the shell of this vehicle and and the mayhem that would result now for the car itself other than saying clearly this is not finished clearly you need an engineer to finish this and even though you see models and I've provided links where you can see more images where you can see videos of modern replicas you can buy a small replica about this big yourself and put it together with balsa wood and send it around besides this we now know and we've known for about 20 years that this was not supposed to be a vehicle a real vehicle for transportation this was supposed to be a theatrical prop 
in 14, 1478, when Leonardo was still young in Florence, they asked him to provide something that would be able to bring to the front of the stage the statue of the Madonna, possibly, or a saint. Something that could be activated simply by pulling a cord, because what you see in here, see these are pieces of metal, and these are basically springs. So you turn those cogwheels, and you store the energy, blocking the cogwheels, and then when you release the cogwheels, this machine, which you have to imagine about three feet by three feet, no more than that, maybe even smaller, with a statue made of plaster, right? Plaster was commonly used for statues of saints and the Madonna, etc. So not very heavy, not marble. This statue, from the back of the stage or the side of the stage, would <laughs> advance, and people would go, oh, miracle, right? Deus es machina as the people in theater used to say. And again, look at the videos. I don't want to waste any time in here because you can do that at home. So even for the automobile, this was not intended as a real vehicle. It is a small self-propelled vehicle, but just a prop for a sacred theatrical representation. Here you can appreciate what I was saying before, how you can store energy with springs, and springs were nothing new. Even the ancient Greeks and the Romans knew about springs. Ingenious, but nothing more than that. And you can read the notes I left there and watch the video. So, even though things changed a lot 150 years later with the invention and introduction of the steam engine, most probably, there were some steam-engined vehicles that worked, that were made in one or two prototypes. But the first one for which we have solid historic evidence is the one that you see in here. Are you able to, to see the screen? I'm trying not to cover this. So this was made by a French engineer working for the French army. It's a three-wheeler with the steam engine up front. You see the big boiler, so essentially you put coal in here, you light the coal, you put water in here, the coal will heat up the water, and since this is made of copper, a lot of pressure will build up enough to move up and down these pistons, moving the front wheel. The front wheel is also the wheel that you use to direct the vehicle. So you can imagine the amount of strength required to steer this kind of vehicle. Of course, you notice, you cannot fail to notice how you have a lot of weight in front, right? Because you have coal, you have a good amount of water, right? You have all the gears in here. How is this compensated? Why this imbalance? Engineers from this period before the French Revolution were not silly, uh, right? Could not ignore this. Well, the purpose of this vehicle is to use the bed in the back for artillery, specifically for the barrels of the artillery guns. So imagine two of, or three of those big barrels thick because artillery up until that time was over-engineered. They couldn't calculate precisely how thick the metal should be to avoid the gun exploding and killing the crew uh, manning the gun, so you have more than enough uh, weight under normal conditions of operation in the back to balance for this. Nowadays, there are a few working replicas, and I added a YouTube video of the working replica. 
nowadays, if you have a replica, you have to put a lot of water in the back, right? In order to balance the weight. So between the 1760s and the 1770s, two or three of these steam vehicles were made and tested by the French army. According to tradition, one of them had an accident, hit a wall. We're not surprised how you steer this. And if you have no experience, you may underestimate how difficult it is to manage. So this is officially the first self-propelled vehicle. Call it an automobile would be too much, right? And you have some information here about the inventor and you have a video, let's see if the video works. Okay, after this commercial, of course. To improve their hearing yes, I'm here. sure. There it is, top speed, two to three miles per hour. But it doesn't matter, it's the ability to move a lot of cargo. <laughs> Fire, right? Fire, artillery, gunpowder, and of the best combination, steam, hot steam coming out. And you see they added themselves ballast in the back. More ballast, big barrels, right? Okay, there you have it. As I said, we have documents mentioning precursors precursors this is one of the most interesting apparently a jesuit missionary who went to china during the earliest part of the 17th century made this vehicle and again the ancient greeks knew about the energy produced by steam and made some simple toys the romans knew about it the chinese knew about it so it is possible someone else may have uh, made something that was actually working right you see here it's, it's a bit fantastic right you have the fire you have the water in here you have the steam going to turn this wheel and then through a series of cogwheels, the energy would be sent to the axle, right? And moving the back wheels of this. But no evidence, right, this was made. Maybe it was just an idea. We know that there were a few attempts before the train were introduced of having steam carriages. This is one of the most famous, the London steam carriage one or two of them were made and uh, we have illustrations of an alleged accident during which the uh, the vehicle exploded the steam engine exploded and, and you, you have this nice illustration which used to be um, seen at philadelphia in one of the museums of people flying in all directions being thrown out of this Courage. But the reasons why this didn't work before trains were introduced and then trains worked is that this still works other than the fact that you have this apparatus, uh, the, the steam engine attached to a regular carriage, which makes it very cumbersome. But imagine also that you have these big wheels made of wood trying to move on roads that were essentially unpaved, right? Basically, it was compressed dirt or bricks in some urban areas, not very even, right? And therefore, you have issues of maneuverability. You have issues of grip and traction, right? Because on cobblestones, the wheels will spin and not move well, not have enough grips. On dirt roads, you need a lot of energy to move the wheels because you have a lot of grip, 
right? A lot of energy is necessary to start the vehicle in motion. Whereas with the tracks, the metal tracks, and the metal wheels of the train, you have the ideal situation, right? Grip is reduced, and the weight of the engine, of the locomotive engine, is such that the wheel will not simply spin. So you solve a lot of problems with the trains that you would have faced earlier with these steam vehicles. Later on, of course, you have a lot of things coming together in the working of the automobile, including wrapper, right? And everywhere there were attempts to do this. This is a steam-powered carriage from Turin, and you have videos as well. Uh, this can be found at the Museo dell'Automobile in Turin, where they also have this display in the back now. Uh, where they show you an image of horses pulling this and then the horses disappear and smoke comes up because this has become a horseless carriage. But this is essentially a traditional carriage, right, with the same kind of cabin, with comfortable suspensions, and then you have this heavy steam engine in the back which needs to be fed coal Right? So you need one or two people to keep it going and you need a steering apparatus connected to the front wheels. They were just single pieces. They didn't work well. Look at the size of this engine, right? Almost as big as the cabin. And then, just a few years later, we're still between the 1850s and 60s, you have the first internal combustion engines. This is by an Italian from Luca called Barsanti, but it was patented in London in 1854 or 56. Uh, and this is by a French, well, a Belgian engineer, speaking French, Lenoir, from, uh, well, patented it in 1860, from the same period, okay? Both are much smaller and not as heavy as a steam engine. So, clearly, later on, they will be producing steam, uh, steam engine automobile so much that in the early 1900s, between 1900s and 1910, they'll take as much as a third of the car automobile market. Right, Mark, brands such as Stanley Steamer, for example. But by that time, by 1900, by the year 1900, they were able to produce smaller steam engines that were still effective, functional, and safe. Meaning, by then, they could calculate how much metal you need to withstand the temperatures and the pressures generated by steam engines. Around this period, the internal combustion engine was much more efficient in its ratio between weight and output. And even though a small engine like this would produce between half horsepower and two HP, that's enough, right? That's enough for a small vehicle that will not be very fast, but that's enough to move a vehicle with people, right? Even later on, my own Piaggio scooter, when I was 14, had 2 HP, and I was able to drive up to 25 miles per hour, okay? The uh, first car, the Benz car driven by Berta Benz, was not very powerful, under 2 HP for sure, although we don't have the original any longer. And this impressed so much the people reading about these new inventions. So you have an engine, but you don't have a car yet, and it would take another uh, 25 to 30 years to have a car. But this was seen as so impressive that just a couple of years later, you have the first science fiction film, uh, book 
by Jules Verne, and we'll read a few pages, imagining cars with this kind of engine in Paris, right? Offering their services as taxes in Paris. It was even easier to produce vehicles with electrical engines, and a lot of unique prototypes were made during the last part of the century. This is a famous one, and you have a replica at the Museo de l'Automobile in Turin. It's called Les Jamais Contentes, the never satisfied, the never contented, meaning never, speed is never enough for this vehicle. The first official vehicle to reach 100 kilometers per hour, that is 65 miles per hour, okay? And, as I said, the earliest years in the 1900s, you have about a third of circulating vehicles moved by electricity, a third moved by steam, and a third moved by internal combustion engines. I added the bicycle for a reason. First, this allegedly would be another invention by Leonardo. This allegedly was found in a manuscript by Leonardo, but it was only seen in the 1970s. Why? Because two pages of this manuscript were glued together. And at some point, an Italian scholar by the name of Marinoni asked and obtained permission from the friars in whose convent the manuscript was found to try and use chemicals to unglue these two pages. When the pages were unglued, this apparently was seen, and since then there was this legend that Leonardo invented the bicycle. At this point, very few people believe this is by Leonardo. It was either a prank of the Italian scholar who found it, who later died in 1994, uh, or someone else before the time it was discovered had drawn this, meaning for sure you see these circles, these circles were by Leonardo for sure. And Leonardo began a lot of representations of cogwheels with a circle and then add the teeth of the cogwheel, but somebody must have added everything else because what is surprising is that instead of a prototype, Leonardo would have drawn a ready-made bicycle with everything on it. So you have the handlebar, you have the pedals, you have the chain, you have, you see the teeth on the back uh, wheel, you have the saddle. This is a complete bicycle, which doesn't happen for inventions. And we don't have any other drawing of earlier drafts, earlier prototypes, right? So whoever drew this, knew about the bicycle already, saw these circles, and like a kid said, wow, I can draw a bicycle in here, I can complete this as a bicycle. The friars never allowed for, later on, as requested by some scholars, never allowed for a chemical analysis of the colors, of the pigment of the colors, which would probably tr prove that these colors are not from the 1500s they're more recent. If not, if it wasn't the Italian scholars, someone else in the past did that. One of the friars, who knows? Friars have a strange uh, sense of irony. But I added this because by 1886, which is the time of this bicycle, the bicycle was perfected, basically, right? Everything you need for a well-functioning, fast bicycle can be found in here, and not only it was the machine that provided first the sense of the feeling of speed for individuals, not for a group of people like the train or the steamship, but for an individual, but also it became the sport of daredevils. Races were held in Europe and in the US and people would come and see the cyclists drive inside velodromes. This is an example, right? You have a wooden surface, you have an oval 
you have inclined banks because this way you can go around without ever having to steer or slow down. It was very dangerous, speed were very high. One of the reasons why you often see two, three or four people is that you have more energy and the overall bicycle is light enough that four strong people can propel this to quite a speed and there were plenty of accidents, especially because these velodromes were often improvised. So they weren't very safe from a structural point of view. They were made because someone wanted to offer this kind of show and people would come. We even have this weird anecdotal evidence of uh, velodromes such as this, where the wood had cracked and there were openings in the wood and kids would try to peer from these holes to see the bicycles come by. That's how dangerous they could be. The, the other reason why it, it, we, we should keep the bicycle in mind is that we have plenty of anecdotal evidence that the same people who in the 1880s and 90s were involved in this kind of sport of speed then went to work as chauffeurs. Chauffeur is a professional driver, the word is French, but it was used in England and in the US as well, in Italy as well, for example. So a lot of them use their knowledge and experience of high speed, their courage and ability to face risks on a moving vehicle, converted those skills into becoming professional drivers for rich people who would buy an automobile but wouldn't bother with learning how to drive or thought it was too risky. Okay, so keep that in mind. And in fact, even in the young adult literature around this time, you find a lot of books celebrating the heroes of the bicycles who are driving very fast on the, on the bicycles. And then, of course, Around the same time of the first Benz automobile, you'll find the first motorcycle, the first official motorcycle made by Daimler in Germany, right? And you see, it's not very simple, it's not easy, right? You have a very small engine, you have the handlebar, you have the chain, multiple wheels to keep it balanced. In this case, you have wooden wheels. So can you imagine the amount of vibrations going through the body of the driver? This is not a vehicle, this is a torture machine, right? Not to mention all the risks connected with trying to drive this, okay? Any questions, any comments before I move to my next presentation? And if you want, we can put back the trash can because I feel that very hot in here, not too much air. I don't know if there is noise outside, but otherwise we could try and keep the door ajar with the trash can so that we have a little bit of oxygen going to our brains. Questions, even questions that are peripheral uh, to this presentation, any curiosity? across your minds, yes, um, and, and your names. Uh, Jared, Jay, you know okay. works. I was sure. curious what part of um, the scuba equipment did um, Leonardo contribute to? So you, you have a helmet and you have a series of pipes so that it's not uh, uh, like the system we use today for the most part with oxygen tanks, etc. Is is more similar to the equipment used by the Navy uh, to repair ships underwater or uh, to, to work on submarine apparatuses or place mines, etc. Uh, so you have this, this helmet with pipes bringing air from the surface of the water into the helmet and you would be able to breathe. Of course, 
unless you have a pump, it's not just enough to have a pipe, an opening above the water. Normally these days you also need a pump to pump air to the, into the helmet, otherwise not a lot of air after a while uh, is there. But you find a lot of these in not only Leonardo's notebooks, but in other engineers' manuscripts, not just in Italy, but other countries as well with a similar ideas. And then those ideas were not really experimented with in a practical fashion until the 19th century, especially the second part of the 19th century, for example. That's when you have the first submarines used during the Civil War, moved with human energy, right? Uh, the humans inside are moving the propeller. There is no engine. And some of those submarines, uh, submersibles, suffered accidents and the crew died. And if you're from Long Island, you may have seen the plaque <laughs> in uh, New Suffolk on the North Fork near Matitok, uh, indicating that the first operational fleet of US Navy submarines uh, was stationed there. And they were very small submarines. You, you, even the size of the bay tells you how small they must have been. OK? No, that's all right. OK, thank you, Jared. Any other questions before we proceed? Okay, so I'll continue with the next presentation about mobility, energy sources, and civilization. I use civilization here loosely because I've added a few historical elements, bits of information to contextualize technologies in some societies. And it's not global, it's limited to some areas and some periods. And the general ideas you're supposed to retain. You don't have to learn, memorize all the details. So we start with this period between 3000 and 500 BC, right? And I've used the same matrix through the periods. You'll find four or five periods, no more. So a few notes about society and the economy during this period. Societies usually go from foraging to relying on agriculture. Foraging means just to pick whatever nature offers, right? Wild fruits, plants, etc. You move from barter to commerce, right? Barter is where you say, I have a chicken, you have sheep, and you give me the wool, and I'll give you the chickens. Uh, and in terms of urbanization, you go from a multiplicity of villages to the first big cities during this period. And when you look at the cities, the most famous cities of antiquity, Nineveh in Mesopotamia, Athens in Greece, Alexandria in Egypt, Rome in Italy, where are they located? They're located near the water. It's either a river, the sea, or a river leading to the sea. Right? Even in the city of Rome that you can see today, you had not only a port outside of Rome, which nowadays is called Ostia, but you had a port inside the city of Rome. The river could be navigated by ships. So transportation was a key element to the development of these societies. And for every Period, we will focus on energy sources available for transportation or mobility, right? Transportation of goods, mobility of people, and work. Because work too can be part of mobility, right? Because you can use energy to move a tool. If you have a hammer and instead of using your arm, you want to develop a system where the hammer comes down, moved, let's say, by water pushing on a wheel, then that too is, in, on a smaller scale, an example of movement or mobility and productivity in general, what is more productive. So when we look at the oldest period, what we find in here is that the number one 
source of energy during this period is humans, right? And that is true up until the first part of the 20th century, right? So it seems weird to us. We cannot imagine that people would be used to move goods or to move machines, but it was very much so. And the farther back you go, and the more you find this to be true. Second to humans, animals. And we start with horses. Horses were used everywhere. Horses are very strong. Of course, you can have different breeds. You can breed horses for speed and agility or breed horses for strength and ability to pull. Okay, but average car of today could be moved by a single horse. Even a big truck and 18 wheelers, you need between four and six horses, depending on the kind of horses to move that. Although a horse would be able to move, a single horse would be able to move your car and multiple horses would be able to move a truck if the vehicle is on rubber wheels and on a paved road because that minimizes the grip. If the track is stuck in a ditch, six horses won't do it, right? Because they don't have enough power to move it out, to make it start moving. But horses are much stronger than anyone here could imagine. Donkeys, same thing. Moles is a hybrid, right? Between a horse and a donkey. Camels were used in Africa, Middle East, and Asia oxen everywhere, elephants in some parts of Africa and Asia, dogs also. Another source of energy is water, right? Because you use water to move boats, to ship goods, to move supplies, military supplies, soldiers, and to move humans everywhere. Fire, from, mostly from wood, can be used as a source of energy. Wind, can be used to move boats, although often you see that the sails are only one component of transportation via uh, the, the sea, because a lot of civilizations, for example the Romans, would combine human rowers, again humans are moving the ship, with sails, because the sails by themselves, based on their development of that technology, were not enough because the Romans would put a lot of goods, commercial goods, on those ships, or they would put 100 soldiers with horses, with supplies, and therefore with a heavy ship, the wind is not enough for them. Later on, they perfected, the, they developed huge sails, but the Romans didn't have those. Gravity and pressure were sources of energy. For civilizations using irrigation systems, right? Use gravity and inclination to move water where you want to go, and aqueducts, right? The Romans were able to develop aqueducts that were tens of miles long, long which seems simple, but it's not. You have to have the right uh, inclination through the entire aqueduct. You have to have reservoirs where you collect water to maintain the flow but for example they use a very famous one going from behind Mount Vesuvius at the times of the Romans all the way to the Bay of Naples and to this day you can see the Piscina Mirabilis the marvelous reservoir that collected the water and they did it because in the port of Naples the Romans kept a lot of military of their military fleet and they needed fresh water they needed the vegetables produced in that area uh, around Naples and, and fresh water to put on those ships. What were, in other section I've repeated throughout this presentation, what were the newest, the best ideas for mobility, for efficiency, for the use of energy? Of course, the first one is the wheel. Great invention and you can produce commercial carts or produce all kinds of mobile weaponized carriages. The lever 
is also a technology, a simple kind of machine used a lot, especially ancient civilization used a lot of cranes and pulleys, right? Just look at the pyramids or look at the Colosseum and other huge buildings. There were no machines and I guarantee there, were no, there was no alien technology. Okay? No anti-gravitational gun to move those stones. And the bow and arrow. Bow and arrows, bows and arrows were used by Stone Age humans, right? But by this time, they were so efficient that were very effective very powerful. To this day, with a simple bow and arrow, even without a titanium tip, you can go through the body of a car, like nothing. The biggest technology in terms of strategic power during this period, ships, the wheel, carriages, horses, and domesticated animals. And what is that this civilization knew about but couldn't exploit? Coal, they knew about coal, but they only used it to, to hit places. Oil, again, they were used either to produce light or for heating. They knew about steam, but they just did some simple toys, nothing more. Now we come to the proper time of the Romans, called Roman Empire during the first part, Rome was a republic and only later became an empire, it doesn't matter. And you have a few uh, keywords about their civilization, I'm going to skip over those. When it comes to energy sources for transportation or productivity, nothing new. Everything remains the same, which you will see a lot of, right? The only novelty is that now water is being used to activate water mills, which is a big thing. And in terms of efficiency, Roman pulleys, Romans were very good at making pulleys for uh, building things. Long aqueducts, as I mentioned, a network of roads, one of the keys so the success of the Roman Empire was that they had a network of roads that were well maintained and therefore you could move commercial items as well as military supplies and soldiers through the empire. Which is why the Romans sometimes lost battles, but they were never defeated as a system, as a society, as an empire for a very long time. They could always come back from a single defeat because they would have just to move more supplies and soldiers through those roads efficiently and quickly enough. Nothing in terms of big th biggest things and no but not fully exploited include cogwheels. They were very good with them but they didn't do much with it. Springs, same. They could make good springs but didn't find the use and they experimented with windmills but they were not they didn't take off they were not very common let's move on to the early modern era last part of the middle ages including then the renaissance and here you find some historical and social development in terms of energy sources a lot of same as before. Yes, horses are used more systematically, for example, for the military. Ships are getting bigger, right? And they can travel far, farther and, and faster, definitely. And in fact, you have the period of explorations. Whereas the Romans, Roman ships, where is that archeologists find the remains of Roman ships? It's always near the coast because they were traveling the Mediterranean, but for the most part, they were staying not too far from the shoreline. Okay? And streams of water were used for water mills, but also to activate shop tools. So whenever in an urban area, of course, cities were built in a place that was pristine, 
and in any place you find little streams of water. Those streams often during the Middle Ages or the Renaissance were not destroyed, they were not redirected. They simply built roads and buildings above those streams so that, forget Venice, but even if you go to Bologna, even if you go to other places in Tuscany, there are still streams of water under the roads, under the buildings. And they were kept there for a reason, because if you had water under your shop, you could then use the, the moving water to move a wheel and connect that to a shop, to a tool in the shop, and move that as well, right? You need a wheel, you need a belt or a chain, and there you are. This time, springs were used more efficiently. In the military, of course, you find springs inside catapults, inside ballistas, which are like giant crossbows, and the crossbows themselves. Before uh, gunpowder, crossbows were some of the most efficient, most precise and powerful guns. Biggest thing of this early modern era is the use of chemicals and chemical compounds. They not only knew about, but used, finally, used flamethrowers, okay? And Greek fire is a somewhat mysterious compound, although we have an idea of what was in it, that was like napalm uh, used in the Vietnam War. You could throw it even from a ship to another and could not be extinguished. That fire could not be extinguished with water. In fact, Greek fire could float and burn above the water. Okay, so uh, uh, secret weapon, right, for, for the uh, navies of the period. Of course, gunpowder is invented, and from gunpowder you have artillery which can win a war for you. The King of France invades Italy in 1494, and essentially he wins the war because he has a couple of dozen of big artillery guns. If someone is not accepting, guaranteeing safe passage to the French army, they just place their artillery guns and start shooting until the others surrender. Right, so. Things they knew about but couldn't really exploit include gunpowder because their knowledge and use of gunpowder was very rudimentary. Again, they knew about steam, we know that, couldn't do anything with it. And they knew about chemistry in a very simple, simplistic way, it was called alchemy, that branch of knowledge. They could make some explosives, but they were not very efficient at that, and they could use chemical gases but they didn't know much about it. And now we come to the modern era, the industrial era, right? So the time of industrialization, of capitalism, of nationalism. But in terms of energy sources for transportation, more of the same, right? That is to say, humans, animals, starting from horses going down through the list, donkeys, mules, etc. Okay. They did use coal a little more because they needed coal to produce steam. And steam, the steam engine, was really the foundation for the development of industrialization. They did use oil, but mostly for illumination, and natural gas as well for illumination. Nuestec, the steam engine, used in a factory, not for mobility. Gas lighting, all of a sudden you have plenty of light, people change their habits, right? Uh, you know how uh, in many places people before the practicality of modern lightings 
they would go to bed early, sleep a few hours, wake up in the middle of the night, stay up a few hours with the help of a candle, then go back to sleep until dawn. And sleeping through the night is a more modern habit. Electricity, again, used for the telegraph first, then finally, at the end of that century, the light bulbs. We have electromagnetism introduced. Alessandro Volta invents the electrical battery, and they work on this. More importantly, as we've seen, they introduce trains in large numbers everywhere, right? Steamships, the bicycle, we've talked about it, and how important it is for individual mobility, this idea that you are one with this kind of machine. And the most strategic technologies are trains, because you can use trains to move weapons and soldiers, steamships, same things, assembly lines, of course, and don't forget dynamite, chemical compounds, dynamite developed during the 19th century, because besides military applications, it was used to build the canals, Panama Canal, Suez Canal, used a lot of dynamite to break the big rocks, or to build tunnels as well. What is that they knew about but couldn't do much about? They knew about hot air balloons and dirigibles, but they were mostly for entertainment or light reconnaissance for the military. Even during the Civil War, they used some of those. Artillery was rendered more mobile. They introduced machine guns that were used during the Civil War, some forms of automation, and submarines by the end of the century. And finally, the, this section is very important because we assume that we are modern, and once modernity introduced those technologies, everything from the past disappeared. But it isn't so. Modernity and modern technologies go back in terms of big numbers, frequent use, only go back a few generations. It's really, at this point, not your grandfathers, but your great-grandfathers, your great-grandparents, sorry. Okay? So if you take sailboats, sailboats were used all over the world in massive numbers for fishing and transportation up until the 1910s. Even later they were used. But up until 1910, if you see a picture of a port, including the port of New York, if you see a painting of a French port by a French Impressionist, they loved painting train stations, ports, arbors, you see a lot of sailboats. Even around this area, the Northeast, where people would go to hunt whales or to fish, and boats were used for transportation of goods. On Long Island, connect, the shores of Connecticut, Massachusetts, etc., a lot of sailboats were used into the 20th century. Right? They didn't disappear simply because the steam engine was better. Porters. Porter means the use of a human who would put on his shoulder weight, uh, uh, the, the weight of a box, of a container, and then move that over a distance. Porters were widely used all over the world. I'm not talking about Europe, but everywhere from Europe to China to Africa and South America up until the 1930s. Okay? Horses. Horse-drawn carriages, barges pulled by horses. I don't know if you've ever seen this in pictures or illustrations, but for example, there is a, uh, a book, a police detective story by Georges Simenon, who's a Belgian writer writing in French during the 20th century. Around 1930, he published the Carter of the Providence, where Providence is the name of a barge that is navigating the canals that were available at that time 
and would allow you for navigation from Paris to the sea, from the Paris to the Mediterranean. So this barge in the story is pulled by horses. They have horses inside the barge. Whenever they need to move, they take those horses on either side of the canal, and the horses pull with ropes, with big ropes, pull this barge with tons of material, because as I said, horses are very strong, along the water. Two horses can do that because, of course, water offers no friction, so even if you have a lot of weight, you can uh, do that. So, this kind of mobility was used into the 1940s. In the middle of the war, 1942, one of the most advanced and most mechanized armies in the world, the German army, half of that army moved on horses. Soldiers, supplies, spare parts, artillery, okay? Even the Germans who were the theorists of the Blitzkrieg, of the mechanized flash war, relied on horses a lot. Steam trains and steamboats were used well into the 1950s, even later, but well into the 1950s, a big percentage of humans and goods move by train on trains that have a steam engine. And bicycles, of course bicycles are used even today, but up until the 1960s throughout the world, there are millions, hundreds of millions of people who use the bicycle, rely on the bicycle, not for pleasure, but to go to work, to move around. That's their primary means of transportation. Let me circulate the attendance while I'm finishing this, wrapping this up, okay? So keep this in mind, all technologies didn't completely disappear until recently, or their use didn't go down until recently, because of course you still find sailboats around the world, right? There are still fishermen going out with a sailboat, uh, etc. And, and the same is true for some of these things. But even growing up in my hometown in Tuscany, I would see carts pulled by horses on a regular basis. Not for the tourists, right? But cars bringing concrete or uh, dirt or other items. They were not the majority of the traffic. They were still there. And the final section, which you can go through yourself, is a list of the different technologies that come together within the automobile. Because it's not enough to have rubber wheels internal combustion engine, you need a lot of things, right, which explains why they were developed so late. You need to have gasoline or benzene, so you need to have to know how to produce that from oil. As an alternative, you need to know how to use steam or electrical power. You need oil or gas, then electricity for the headlights, right, to move during the night. You need to be able to control the explosion, right? You put, you inject fuel, and then you light the fuel, and you have this small explosion that moves the pistons in this engine. You need to know about metallurgy enough so that your engine doesn't explode, right? You need to know about electromagnetism because you have spark plugs igniting the fuel. And those spark plugs get their electricity from magnetos, not batteries, those were introduced later. And, and then of course electrical light. You need springs for the suspensions. You need levers all through the car. You need different kind of cogwheels to move the energy, transfer the energy from the engine to the axles. You need pumps. And initially, on the first cars, why do you see often, for example, in races, you see two people on a car? Because the people on the car had to pump, like a bicycle pump that you used to inflate. You need a pump 
operated manually to pump gas into the engine, to pump oil into the engine. Right. You need to have rubber, natural or synthetic. You need to know about cooling and how to circulate cooling liquids, how to have pressure in that system, right? You need to have air intakes and radiators. You need to know about aerodynamics. You need to have a road made for cars. Macadam is the first form of modern pavement. Asphalt is the later stage. You need to have gas stations, right? Because you've invented the automobile, where is the infrastructure? You need to have road signs, otherwise it would be a mess. You need to have traffic rules. Who gets the right of way? Which side of the road do you drive? And countries moved, right? had different choices. For example, Italy was like Great Britain initially, then they switched to the other side. Uh, you need to impose fines for speeding or parking, you need to have driver's licenses, etc. So a lot of technologies and social policies need to come together for, for the system of cars to work.